welcome to the Aircraft Certification Channel. I'm Rafaela Caio, and today we are here to talk about aircraft performance. And to do that, we invited Gustavo Di Fiori, who is a specialist in aircraft and engine performance. If you like aircraft development and certification, please subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to receive a notification every time we upload a new video. Go to our website on www.aircraftcertificationchannel.com and subscribe to our mail list. Hope to see you there. Welcome on board and enjoy your journey. Hello, Gustavo. How are you? Doing fine. Thank you. So, Gustavo, thanks for being here with us today. It's my pleasure. And we are going to talk about aircraft performance, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so before we start, could you please introduce yourself? My name is Gustavo de Fiori dos Santos. I, I have over 20 years experience with aircraft manufacturing and development and certification. And I have worked for air framers and engine manufacturers during my experience. And I have worked in several countries, including Germany, Brazil, and now in Japan. Okay, so now we are here in Japan, right? Yes. <laughs> Let's start from the beginning. So could you start explaining what's aircraft performance and what are the main aspects to be considered? Yes, aircraft performance is a broad subject, but basically, I have a model here to explain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it Great. can be summarized as a study of the main force acting on the aircraft. And for instance, can you, for instance, guess what is one important force acting on the aircraft? Okay, so I think when the aircraft is flying, lift should be an important force. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> lift. <laughs> I have an arrow here, so lift is an important force. It, it ensures that the aircraft is flying. Right? Okay. So, lift when the aircraft flies, steady flight, lift balance with weight. So, weight pulls it down. Okay? Other two forces that are important is the drag of the aircraft pulling it back and in order to balance the drag we have the engines providing thrust. Okay, so those are the main forces acting on the aircraft. Once we understand how the force acts on the aircraft, we can determine whether the aircraft is capable of meeting a certain requirement, a mission a payload, okay, takeoff distance, landing distance. So that's the main definition of performance. All right, so it seems it's, a, it's very related to the aircraft operational uh, capabilities and limitations, right? Exactly, yes. And how do you, uh, how do you calculate the performance? Okay, in order to calculate performance of the aircraft, we have two main pillars. Okay, one of them is the drag puller. So the drag puller is the relationship between thrust, the lift and drag of the aircraft. And the other pillar is the engine thrust. Okay, so with these two, we combine, make a model of the aircraft, which we use to do the predictions of the aircraft performance in the whole envelope. Okay, so the tra drag polar is very famous for people that are working with uh, aviation and yeah. air dynamics. So could you explain a little bit what's the drag polar? Okay, the drag polar, if you think of an aircraft, we talked about lift okay, and drag. So the drag polar is the relationship between these two parameters. So we normalize lift in a coefficient that we call coefficient of lift. And we also normalize drag in a coefficient of drag. Okay, and then the, well, we have the relationship between these two coefficients for the several attitudes of the aircraft. Okay, and then that is the drag polar. And how is it determined? How do you determine okay. the drag polar? The drag polar is determined from the beginning of the project. Okay, on the early stages of the of the uh, aircraft. Development, there is the early phase of the project. Uh, the drag polar is estimated based on numerical analysis, CFD. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, it's done by the aerodynamics team. Then, 
as you develop the prog the prog in the program. The company makes a model of the aircraft, a reduced scale model, a bit bigger than this one, <laughs> a reduced scale, and we do wind tunnel tests. Okay. okay. Then the wind tunnel results that are used to tune the CFD prediction. Okay. Uh, and then as we develop, the company built a full scale aircraft, and from the beginning of the flight tests, the company does uh, tests, performance tests, in order to tune the drag puller. So that's, as you see, the drag puller is developed along the development phase of the aircraft. Okay, so it's like an interactive process where you have several loops and in each interaction you're, you're going to improve your results, right? Exactly, exactly. One of the results is this. Sometimes we detect points to be improved, then we give this feedback to the systems, to their dynamics, to the manufacturing, to improve their processes as well. So exactly, so look, every time we do testing, every time we have results, we show to the companies, we show to the managers, and then that helps them taking decisions as well, where to invest in the development of their craft. Okay, and uh, so you mentioned that there are two main pillars on the air aircraft performance. One is yes. the drag polar and the other one is the engine uh, performance. So could you now explain the engine performance? Okay, engine performance is also, it's basically provided by the engine manufacturer. Okay. Okay, so we receive, in the airframer side, we received an engine model that calculates thrust of the engine. Okay, in the whole envelope. Okay, this model also calculates engine fuel burn. So, then with a combination of the engine model and the drag puller, we make an aircraft model. And with this model, we can calculate payload, takeoff distance, climb, climb performance, ceiling, landing performance, and also we provide data for sales and marketing, like the cost of flight, okay, the range, how many passengers, payload okay. that it can carry. So, Yes, it's, it's, uh, we, we provide information to many people as well. So basically you need to make sure that the aircraft that you're developing will accomplish uh, the mission or whatever you're promising to the customers, right? Yes, that's the goal of the aircraft, the airframer. But in we performance, we say we are the messengers. So we tell the managers, yes, the aircraft is good, it can compete with this competitor, the other competitor, okay. or it cannot. So we provide them this means of also taking decisions whether it should be improved to make it com the aircraft more competitive in the market. And area. what about certification? How it's related to the certification of the aircraft? Yes, so performance, we, as I told you, have models. And then once we have model, we do, so the models can predict performance. Then we need to show to the authorities that the model is a good tool to predict. It's accurate, mm -hmm. okay, it predicts, and it's robust. So we do also flight tests. So we do performance tests, low altitude performance, high altitude performance, climb performance, in order to show compliance with certification. So uh, I would say that maybe the takeoff performance should be one of the most uh, critical ones because the aircraft is heavy and so on. Yes, okay. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> so could yeah. you explain to us uh, how is the takeoff performance uh, calculated? Okay, okay, let's use takeoff performance as an example. Okay. Uh, because there is, I think there's main rules on, the, on takeoff and, and other things of the flight. Okay, <laughs> so I picked the right one. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. So in order, so in order to start, I have two rules: twenty-five one eleven, twenty-five one thirteen, that defines the takeoff distance and takeoff phase. Takeoff distance is we calculate. It's calculated based on a better word to put this. It is determined based on the worst case of four scenarios. So we need to be safe. Right? So we calculate. We have four scenarios to consider, and we take the worst case. So let's see the scenario. So the, the first scenario during the takeoff, so first, takeoff distance is defined from the point where the aircraft starts, the point of the, the, the where it starts moving, until the point where it is 35 feet above ground. Okay, so 
The first scenario that we calculate is a normal takeoff. So we show that the aircraft takes off, everything working, okay, and then we, we measure the distance from the beginning to 35 feet above ground. And for the normal phase, we need to add 15% for safety margin. So we multiply this distance by 1.15. Okay. In order to calculate the first scenario. The second scenario is still with everything working, the pilot accelerates, and for some reason, the pilot needs to stop the aircraft. There's something in the runway, the pilot needs to stop. So it accelerates, but there's a point where the pilot stops. So this axel stop distance is called rejected takeoff or aborted takeoff. It's the second scenario. So we measure the distance with all engines operating. Then we have two other scenarios which are very similar but with one engine inoperative. So for instance, we're accelerating and we have a bird strike, we lose one engine. Then the pilot can continue the flight, depending on the speed, where it is, where the, the, the aircraft, the pilot must continue the flight. So we calculate the takeoff distance with one engine inoperative, or the pilot stops the aircraft. So we also calculate the axial stop distance with one engine inoperative. So the worst case of these four gives us the takeoff distance to be used for certification. Okay, so we can uh, be sure that the aircraft can take off with only one engine, right? Yes, it is designed <laughs> to take off safely with one engine. Okay, okay. and you mentioned and, that... And of course it comes back to the airport, doesn't continue the flight. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's better not to be flying with one engine. Is that the way the seat is possible? Okay. And, and you mentioned that there is a decision point from that the pilot needs to take mm -hmm. a decision whether or not he was going to, to take off. Yes. So could you talk a little bit more about this decision? Point? Yes. Yes, that is the V1 we call decision speed. Okay. This is calculated before the flight. So we perform to generate tables with V1 based on the airport altitude, the aircraft weight, okay, even the, the flap position, the engine power. So there's quite a bit of parameters used to tell the aircraft, to, to, to tell the pilot what V1 is for that takeoff. Okay. So the pilot has that number in mind. Actually, it's noted. So the pilot and the first officer both know the V1. So during the takeoff run, the takeoff, uh, the ground roll, Okay, if the aircraft speed is below V1 and something happens, it is safer to stop the aircraft. The aircraft we guarantee that the aircraft will stop within the limits of the runway. Okay. okay. If, it's, if the aircraft speed is greater than V1, then we say the aircraft cannot stop on the runway, on the limit of the runway. So it is safer to continue the takeoff and then land as soon as possible. Okay, that's V1, it's called decision speed. It's, it is calculated and it's certified during the development phase for, for the airlines that will operate the aircraft. Okay, and, and what about uh, for this uh, stop distance, uh, can you, do you use the brakes of the aircraft? But can you uh, take, uh, uh, take credit, uh, for example, of the thrust reverser? Yeah, that's, I feel that the answer is, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's a question that even some specialists confuse. Okay, uh, during the takeoff uh, for a dry runway, we cannot take credit on the tourist reverse. Okay, okay. So we calculate the distance, and of course, the, the pilot, if the tourist reverse is operational, the pilot can uh, activate the tourist reverse to stop. But that's not that's not uh, the credit is not taken that way. We can take credit for takeoff in wet runway. So we calculate you know, the, the distance based on first reversal power as well. Okay, so uh, you're saying that uh, for certification, you cannot use uh, the thrust reversal to certify that stop distance. But if in the operational life, if it happens, the pilot can still use the thrust reversals if they are operational. Yes, the pilot, exactly. Ooh, that, Let's say we cannot take credit of the first reverse, okay, but the pilot can always use, use. it. And again, on wet runways, we take credit, we do take credit. Okay. Okay, it's for dry runway. But the pilot, of course, will be safer and he will, I would imagine, the pilot use the first reverse <laughs> always when he he it's to, to stop anyway. there. Yeah. 
Okay, so and in, in this is the finish uh, line for the takeoff, or <laughs> where, where does it end? Okay, we talked about takeoff distance. Okay. Okay, and actually takeoff is defined. Okay, until the aircraft is, the takeoff ends when the aircraft is fifteen hundred feet above ground level, and it is defined in, in some segments. So it, we define it in ground roll. So when the aircraft is ground, is running, uh, rolling the ground until lift off. Okay, and then after lift off, we have some four segments. So the first segment is from lift off until gear is up. So when you fly, you say, oh, gear. you can hear the gear being retracted. So you say, oh, that's the first segment. Okay. When the gear, landing gear is retracted, okay, it starts the second segment. So the second segment says from that point, gear retracted until a safe altitude, which is at least 400 feet above ground. So you need to show that the aircraft with one engine operative can fly to the safe altitude 400 feet, or if there is any obstacle at higher, higher, that's higher than 400 feet, we need to show that the aircraft goes over that obstacle with one engine in operative and we will still have 35 feet margin to that obstacle. Then the third segment starts from the, from the point where uh, we reach the safe altitude, okay, then the pilot starts retracting, starts retracting flaps and accelerating the aircraft. So that's the third segment. So if you hear but we retract the sound, that's the third segment, so I'm a safe altitude. And then when that the third altitude ends on the climb speed. So that's usually economic speed. Then uh, then at, when the aircraft reaches that, that, uh, that speed, it continues climb until 1,500 feet above ground. And 1,500 feet is the end of the takeoff. Takeoff okay. uh, path. Okay, so it's uh, really um, a lot more than the, the takeoff distance. Yes, and there are several rules for that. There's rules for climbing gradient, there's rules for uh, you know, the, the flap retracting speed. So we, we, there are quite a bit of rules to follow during the takeoff phase. For each of the segments. For each of the segments. Okay, so it seems like we will need uh, more videos to talk about those segments and even yes. for the other phases of the flight. And there um, are so many, so many rules that the companies usually have specialists okay. for determining for some parts of the takeoff. So it's, it is very important. Okay, so I'm already inviting you to come back to another video to, to uh, share your knowledge with us. Thank you, it will be a pleasure, yeah. Okay, and so just before uh, we finish, could you talk about what are the novelties that are uh, being implemented in the performance, uh, in the aircraft performance? Yes, uh, it's interesting. So as you see, performance, there's a lot of modeling in performance, right? So you cannot test the aircraft in the whole envelope of flight conditions, all takeoff, all airport conditions. And so uh, modeling is very important. And nowadays we have seen an improvement on the model capability. So the, the airframers are improving the manufacturing processes. So that reduces the variation between aircraft. That we see improvements on measuring measurements for the tests, so our our parameters can be measured with accuracy is better than 0.5 percent, so half a percent. Okay. Also, we had we see improvements in computational capabilities. So with all of them combined, we can have better models, and at the same time, as it we can improve the prediction for marketing that contributes to you no know, more optimized flight. To reduce the costs and make the flight more accessible, more cheaper. <laughs> okay, so, it, so actually, you're using the models, and they're uh, always being more accurate and providing uh, better results. So then you can kind of refine uh, even better what you're, you're yes. what, what you're calculating. Yes, yeah, so we're tuning, adjusting the model. It's it's becoming better and better. And even today, because of better models and better computational capabilities, the other novelty is the electronic flight deck, EFB, that the pilot is becoming more common, that the pilot has a computer in the cockpit, usually an iPad, and then the pilot can calculate performance of the aircraft, can use it at the hotel in the evening to do the flight planning, because we have better 
computers. Okay, so maybe that's another subject also yes. for another video. <laughs> okay, Gustavo, so thanks very much for being here with us. It's my pleasure. Thank thanks you. for sharing yeah. your knowledge with us and hope to see you again. Thank you. If you want to contact Gustavo directly, his link will be in the description area. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.